Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Norman Penaltman. Just to give you a very, very brief introduction to myself, um, because I'm going to speak about the jihadists, how they managed to infiltrate the Syrian revolution. And we know, all of us, we know the way how it starts uh, in March 2000, uh, 2011. It was a very peaceful revolution. It was all about democracy, freedom of speech, human rights, uh, fighting against corruption, freedom of expression. And then now we start to deal with a different issue to a certain extent in certain places with the rise of very, very hardcore extremists. They call themselves jihadists. They try to attach themselves to a very valuable concept of Islam, which is jihad. But I'm sure you know most of the Muslim world and the vast majority of the Muslims, they disagree with these guys. We talk about 1.6 billion Muslims. Uh, I think all of them, they reject this kind of uh, what's so-called jihadism. Uh, practiced now by Al-Qaeda and its affiliates and what's so-called Daesh or the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant. Myself, I am um, not the same ideology, but I did serve with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan during the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan like 25 years ago. Um, and um, I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of uh, top leaders of the jihadi movement or Al-Qaeda, including Bin Laden himself and Zawahri. But myself, I was... Um, more a uh, nationalist, rather a global jihadist. Our aim, it was to topple the Gaddafi regime in Libya and to establish an Islamic state. It was 25 years ago, but we failed. Now I'm uh, the president of Bullion Foundation. It's a think tank based in London, but we act globally. Our main work is counter extremism and terrorism. Uh, terrorism, it's the hard act or the, uh, the physical act of uh, uh, the, or the, the ideology itself, extremism when it's materialized in the world. We believe more important it's the ideology itself, which is extremism, because that's the infrastructure, infrastructure of, of terrorism. And at the same time, we do a lot of work at the grassroots level, which is um, uh, promoting democracy, human rights, coexistence, pluralism because we believe those two faces of the same coin. You cannot just fight terrorism or extremism without coming up with a different approach or alternatives. So this is my background. Now I will try for the next 20 minutes, or maybe 25 minutes, just to explain how the jihadists, they managed to uh, infiltrate the Syrian revolution. And by the way, just I'm using the same term they use themselves as, as a jihadist, because as I mentioned, jihad, it's a well-respected concept and term in Quran, mentioned, I think, several times, more than 40 times in different ways. And I believe what we're seeing now or witnessing in Syria, it has nothing to do with jihad. But just for the argument's sake, I'm going to use the same term, which is, means Al-Qaeda and its associates and affiliates groups, they share the same ideology. <laughs> Anyway, we know it's not easy to come up with a revolution or to make a revolution from scratch zero. It's very, very difficult. Because revolution usually needs a special circumstances and then it needs the trigger event. So if you ask now, why now in Syria, for instance, we have a revolution. Take a for, for, for instance, Gaddafi, for after 42 years, why only in February 2011 there were a revolution? That's exactly what I'm trying to say because the, the model of governance adopted by dictators uh, will create the circumstances itself, but you still need certain events we call the trigger event when people, they find out, okay, this is our opportunity, so it's all about timing. Now we have to take our chance and to go out and to topple the regime. So that's what happened during the Arab, uh, the Arab Spring. And we know this model, it's not the jihadist model. This is not the way how the jihadists they build their model or the way how they strategize their activities. It's a completely different. Why? Because revolution, you mean you include the entire nation, the entire society. Talk about Muslim, Christian, Alawite, non-Muslims, Kurds, everybody, because it's about the people. And the jihadi model, it's about the elite, the vanguard called at talia Like only few people, like a well-structured organization with a very strong ideology and they are loyal to each other and now they, they have the structure itself, the Amir, the Shura, whatever. They think they are the vanguard. They call, call themselves the Talia. Uh, this concept is developed you know, in, the, uh, in our modern history as Muslims. 
during uh, Sayyid Qutb's period in his well-known work, Ma'alim uh, Fattariq, Milestones. So everybody tried to copycat that idea and to practice it. Uh, I think the Cuban Revolution as well, to a certain extent, and a lot of uh, uh, Gifara himself, I think, teaching, it's, it, I think, reflecting this idea. Okay, if there's no circumstances or there's no evidence, the, the, the vanguards, the only few people with a very strong ideology, they can themselves the trigger the revolution from nowhere if they know exactly how to do it. That's the jihadi model. The Arab Spring is a different issue. So Al-Qaeda, Al 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 I think, defined themselves in, in a, a, a very, very unpleasant or uh, an awkward position because they need to deal with it. How are they going to deal with these issues? You know, like five different countries, which is where part of the what's so-called the Arab Spring, five different countries, and all of them, Al-Qaeda, either uh, have already existing presence or used to have a presence. So it was a very challenging for Al-Qaeda ideology at the time how to deal with these issues. Uh, before I go to the Syrian uh, case itself, I would like just to mention uh, four main points about the strategy itself. How you deal with these issues when you find out there is a revolution going out there and it's not yours. That you just you wake up in the morning or in a certain period and you see people outside, different leaders, different groups, different cities, and you are not ready for that because that's not you. And even the slogans or the purpose of the revolution itself, it has nothing to do with your ideology. It's, it's, it, it, was, it was a very, very big challenge for, for Al-Qaeda. Al uh, that's why I think Al-Qaeda, they, they tried at that period to, to deal with this issue from a very smart, we have to say that, they were very smart how to handle it. If you notice during 2011, there is no single statement from Al-Qaeda leaders try to oppose or to appear as if they are encountering what's going on in the Arab world. Despite we know the slogans or the reasons of that revolution, it was against Al-Qaeda ideology. Take up, talk about democracy, for instance. Al-Qaeda believes democracy is the antidote of Islam itself. That means either or, either Muslim or either a Democrat. So you have to choose between both of them. But they were very smart because they didn't appear as if they are um, against what's going on. Uh, they don't like criticize the leaders of the revolutions everywhere. Even the incident of uh, Bazizi, if you familiar with this name, you know, the guy, the Tunisian guy who set up himself, set up himself on fire in December 2010. People, they think that was the, uh, the trigger event of the uh, Arab Spring, which is um, from academic perspective or very deep analysis. I disagree with that, but just, you know, usually you need a symbol for anything, you know, to, to, to galvanize the whole people behind that, like the word Arab Spring itself. It's good to attach something like this from a media perspective or branding to something like uh, more, um, more sexy, if I may say, you know, like from, from media speaking, instead like said, the revolution itself or bloody revolution or al-kifah, the struggle. It was very, very well uh, uh, established term. So Al-Qaeda at that time, they issued uh, several tapes, videos, uh, statements, such from Zawahri and his top uh, lieutenants, including Atiyatullah, which he was the second in command in Al-Qaeda, and he was the main source of ideology in Al-Qaeda, Atiyah Abdurrahman, he's, he's a Libyan, he was killed two years ago by a drone attack in Waziristan. Uh, all of them, they issued a lot of, uh, uh, I think, lectures, if I may say, in different forms, and it was very smart because they tried to give an interpretation of what's going on. That's the way how they started. It's all about interpreting what's going on, what we call the Arab Spring. And the most important thing for me is, at several times they tried to convince us, and the, 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 the youth mainly, the target were the youth themselves. They said, what you see now, it's our work. We spent the last two decades, especially the 10 years after the 11th of September, just to push the US homogeny on the, on the region out. So that's exactly the results of our work and our sacrificing. You know, our people, our, you know, like uh, uh, brave fighters, they managed really to loosen up the tight ends of 
the U.S. security arrangement in the region. That's now you're dealing with a very weak regimes. So don't forget, this is Al-Qaeda work, and you are now benefiting from the, uh, the, the, the aftermath of the uh, 11th of September. A lot of people, they convinced with that, honestly. I met uh, a lot of them, especially the young people, the, the youth, because there were nobody talking to them. And here's the problem with people they were with democratic approach or people they were uh, 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 preaching or, pro, uh, or encouraging a universal values. Sometimes people, they call it liberal values. Uh, they failed when it comes to the grassroots level. It's very rare to see anyone, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, wherever you go, Tunisia, to see non-Islamists working at the grassroots level. Out there, you know, not in the cities, not in the hotels. There's no media there. You have to go out to the villages, to the remote areas, rural areas, and you have to talk to the people there to mobilize them, to convince them about exactly what you are doing, you know, why you are leading them to this conflict exactly, and what's the achievement. It didn't happen. The only people you see in these areas is the, uh, the, the Islamists. We know, we, we know there's like part of the Islamists, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood school of thought, they don't believe in violence, you know. It's, it's, it's like a normal school of thought, which is, I believe, it's, it's a healthy uh, position. It doesn't mean I support them, but it's a healthy existence, I believe, in a Muslim society if you need a real democratic establishment because you have to give a chance for every single, uh, let's say, ideology or group of people Especially if we know the Muslim Brotherhood, they appeared in several times, especially in Egypt, they represent a significant proportion of the population because they voted, they voted for Morsi, you know, whether we like it or not, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, not Canadians voted for Morsi to be president in Egypt. They were Egyptians, okay? So I'm not talking about the Islamists in general, but the, the, the jihadists themselves, they are very good as well in this field. Going to people, approaching them in their villages, in their mosques, schools, using the internet as well, they spend a huge amount of time and they have like entire army to do that. The opposite is the, the, the activist or the pro-democratic bloc, if I may say, I think their results or their efforts in this field, it's very close from, from, from a disaster. Now let's talk about Syria for the sake of time. Syria was part of the Arab Spring, so we have to understand it from this perspective because it's uh, it's not just something happened by its own. And by the way, uh, maybe you disagree with me. I, I believe the Arab Spring from ideological perspective or theoretical perspective, I believe it starts in Syria, not in Tunisia. 10 years ago, when Bashar al-Assad, as you know in the Arab world, you know, he said his father, and he was established as president of, Egypt, of, of Syria. There were a lot of promises and a lot of very good like, you know, ideas and a lot of people from Syria itself and the Arab world were looking to the Syrian you know, like, uh, uh, spring, if you like, and Damascus spring. And we start to hear a lot of ideas, concepts about human rights, democracy, constitution, anti-corruption, a new president, very young, well-educated in UK. There were a lot of promises, but I think that was the beginning of the Arab Spring from ideological perspective, not the physical one, people shooting at each other. I strongly believe what happened in Syria, it was all over the Arab media. Everybody was listening to what's going on in Syria because we start to hear a lot of uh, ideas, as I mentioned, and don't forget Syria always, always, for many, many years, more than 100 or 200 years, was very crucial part of the Arab world when it comes to ideas and identity. Syria always at the hard core of, of the Arab world. Anyway. So Syria is not just like an isolated case. It was part of the Arab Spring. Why I'm saying this? So it's, it's, it's a main concern to Al-Qaeda, including Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, and Libya. In 2006 and 2005, uh, there's a lot of documents. I've seen a lot of them. Interior documents within Al-Qaeda organization. <clears throat> They discussed the situation in Syria and how come we are fighting in Iraq and we have very strong presence there and we failed to extend our presence in Syria. Okay? And the documents clearly, you know, states like Syria, it's the most important place of earth for us. But it's very difficult to establish anything there. Here comes what I've, what I've said, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's kind of impossible for them to create a revolution or a jihadi movement inside Syria itself. It's difficult, despite their presence in Iraq with all the resources they have there. 
And this assessment, it comes for, it, it, it was the assessment of, as I mentioned, uh, he, he was the Al-Qaeda second in command, but he was the main ideological driver of Al-Qaeda, Atiyah Abdul Rahman. This is his personal assessment in 2006. Uh, because people, I think, they, they asked him several times from Iraq, shall we do something about Syria? And then I think in 2007, there's increasing demands about, let's go and do something in Syria. Because we know, in 2003, after the American invasion of, uh, of Iraq, Syria has been used as a office space for Al-Qaeda and jihadi movements fighting in Iraq. They established a network from Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And now leader of Jabhat al-Nusra, he was part of it, and he was one of the creators of this network, Muhammad Jolani. Adnan <coughs> Hajali. He, he was part of it, and he spent several times in Syria, and in Lebanon itself, and in Iraq. So they were there before us, if I mention you, like people looking for democracy. 10 years, they have 10 years ahead of everybody. They established very good network. They used to have what called Madafa, which is mean like guest house, in Hummus, in Hama, in Damascus itself, and the regime was aware of that. We know that. Because people used to come from all over the world to Syria, and then you have only five entry points to Iraq. All of them at the other side of the border, controlled by Al-Qaeda. The five points. You can get to Iraq, you will see Al-Qaeda people there. No matter who sent you, who you belong to, what's your ideology, whatever, but at the end of the day, you have to end it up. And the Syrian regime and the Mukhabarat, they were aware of that. Basically, they recruited uh, a sheikh, some sheikhs in certain mosques, and they tasked them to facilitate this process, and the government or the muhabarat they were behind, just monitoring and making sure everybody behaved. And this period now appeared very, very important and crucial for al-Assad regime, unfortunately, because he managed to utilize it very, very well against the revolution. Why? In 2007, Iran pressed very hard the Syrian regime, when the Iraqi government started to establish and start to flourish, and now we start to see like kind of a real institutions and governments in Iraq, especially with the come of, or when, when uh, al-Maliki won the election. Iraq asked Syrian regime, especially Bashar, stop the flow of the jihadists from Syria to Iraq. You have to do that. That's it, the end. So what happened, the first thing, they assassinate when known sheikh, I'm sure the Syrian followers here, they know his name, Abu al-Qaqa. He was assassinated. We know he was the contact, you know, person between all the jihadists and the Syrian Muhabarat. So they assassinated him. The signal was clear for everybody. That's it. There's no more jihad from Syria towards Iraq. And then they start to arrest a lot of people. They cracked down the entire network. So they arrested, I think, a few hundreds. About 260 or maybe 280 left alive in Sadiana uh, uh, prison. The regime waited, I think, maybe four or five months from 2011 March until October, because in mid-October, uh, 260 well-trained, well-experienced jihadists has been released with no explanation. And I've seen some documents, which is really ridiculous, you know, because they legalized everything, so no one can hold the regime responsible about, okay, why you release these guys? All of them jihadists coming from different countries, not Syrians, and they've been arrested because of their activities in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia as well. So uh, they fake, you know, a lot of, like, you know, documents, because some of them, I think, uh, uh, they, they give... The, I've seen, it's, it's, it's rubbish, I don't want to waste your time just to read it, but I've seen some legal documents from the regime itself to justify the release of all these numbers of people. 260 well-trained radical jihadists, all of them fighting now in Syria, all of them. And they just left them, you know. We believe usually from our experience when you do that, at least there's 10% they're working with the Muhabarat, the intelligence service themselves. That's the best way to infiltrate any jihadi group. Because it happened in Iraq, it happened in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they sent people to Yemen there, then they returned back with a lot of information. It happened in Algeria in 1995. That's exactly what they do. Prison, usually, it's the best place to infiltrate jihadi groups. So, the, the 260, 
with another move from al-Baghdadi in Iraq, the leader of uh, what's so-called the Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he sent Muhammad al-Julani and well-trained jihadists, most of them they have experience from seven to eight years fighting, some of them 10 to 12 years fighting in many places in the world, and not just fighting, like Al-Julani, the, these guys, they are experiencing something which is very, very important. It's networking, creating networks from one place to another, city to another, and then you create the uh, routes of transportation, then fake documents to make sure everybody can have documents, and then financing all these networks all over the world. It's not easy. Most of the Syrians, you know, they were outside in the streets fighting. That was the first time for them to do that, you know, and they're not aware of these activities just going around with these well-trained jihadists because they were very good in terms of fighting and they are able to sacrifice themselves. A lot of them they, they did an excellent job when it comes to fighting in combat, you know, uh, experience against uh, al-Assad regime. So they appreciated them and I've seen myself several leaders of al jashr al-Hur, uh, officers, ex-officers, and leaders from Raqqa, like professionals, including lawyers, they were shocked about how they've been betrayed by al-Qaeda leaders because they said, we received them. We helped them, you know. We, we gave them space in our houses. We, we, we helped them with everything, you know. And they gave me a lot of the names. This guy, he was like, then ended up the leader of, uh, not now the Islamic State, but Al-Nusra in, in, in Raqqa. Yeah, I, I met the, the guy who received him two years ago, first time. And he helped him and, you know, he did everything possible for him to make his life easy because he's not Syrian. He's a foreigner. So that's, that, that, that's what happened. You have the 260, and then al-Baghdadi sent his people from, from, uh, from uh, Iraq. Uh, and he split his budget, which was very good at the time, 50% every month of the Iraqi jihadist budget uh, went to Syria to support the jihadist fighters there. Every, every, every month, 50%. Including, as I mentioned, like weapons, uh, ammunition, and well-trained leaders. People, they think it's, it's something not significant, but if you analyze how al-Baghdadi he used to, until now, how he financed his terrorist network in Iraq, you'll be shocked. It's a huge amount of money, of, of money in a daily basis, because in most of the areas which is not controlled or ungoverned space by the government, it's controlled by them. In certain places, we find out, you know, especially the routes which when people, they use like huge trucks, you know, moving goods from one place to another, you'll see Al-Qaeda uh, tugs there, if I might say, uh, taxing every single truck to, to sometimes $200. Just imagine, if it, this is one of their like uh, uh, daily routines, you know, $200 per, 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 per truck. You have to pay that, otherwise they'll kill you and they will burn your truck. And they established this now for almost, I think, two or three years. That's what they do. And the government cannot go in these areas. No way. So it's completely controlled by them. Because pe why I'm saying this, people, they keep asking about how they finance themselves, how they get the money. That's exactly how they get the money. So they don't need any third party to donate to them using banks or financial routes we are familiar with. No. It's local. And that depends on their guns only. They don't need fund for money. Other issue is they're taxing a lot of shops in many cities. And until today, while I'm talking to you, and the government knows that, the Iraqi government, but they cannot stop it. In many, many major cities in Iraq, everybody has to pay a tax to uh, al-Baghdadi's people, al uh, the Islamic State in Iraq. Otherwise, they will burn your shop. And a lot of other issues. So just imagine what kind of money every month they collect. So that's why when we analyze the situation as well in Syria, we find out a lot of people, you know, when these guys, they introduce themselves, for instance, in one place, they start with 80 people, most of them foreigners. Then if you come back to them after three months, you will see like 300 people, most of them Syrians. And it's not the same, you know, momentum in other like genuine serious fighters. It's a different. Because of the support, as I mentioned, experience and the money as well. And they're paying very, very well in this, in, in this sense. The, the, three, the three rules you have to be aware of 
in Syria, which is, I think, working everywhere, how to be successful to execute your strategy to infiltrate a revolution. Because we analyze hundreds of events every day. You cannot deal with them. You know, there's like, like incident every single five minutes. So you have to group them in certain, let's say, structure to make sense out of these activities. What the hell is they doing? Okay? You will find only three main points. And that's their power, how they, that's their model to infiltrate the Syrian revolution. First one, it's the ideology. They come up with a well-structured ideology. They call it the Salafi Jihadist, Salafi al jihadiyya Problem is with the Salafi al jihadiyya it's well attached itself to Islam itself. Every time you start to argue against them, they say, oh, this is ayah from the Quran versus from the Quran. Okay, you cannot, you know, just like arguing against Quran. And then, oh, this is authentic hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, that's it. So we'll establish. It's, it's very shallow, very vague, and sketchy. Problem is, it's explaining and interpreting everything without any interpretation. That's the most powerful source of it. That's why you see a lot of people that are willing to kill even their families because they think this is the Quran. Oh, that's the Kafar, that's the Muslim. Their world is always black or white. There is no between. Because they excluded what we know in Islam called the fiqh, which is like the fatwas, the work of the real, well-established, well-known sheikhs. Okay, sometimes you have different opinions, religious opinions, regarding the same situation. They don't deal with it. Their ideology, it's a math. Always one plus one, it will make two. That's it. Problem is, this kind of ideology, it's created a very, very well, uh, 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 I think, established organization and tough fighters as well. Willing to die. Uh, they don't hesitate to sacrifice themselves because every day they're dealing only with this framework of Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah. And everything they think it's just like human work, it's just corrupted by ideas that comes from the West or democratic values, the liberal values, secular values, whatever you call it. So the ideology, it's important, why? Because they managed successfully, based on a lot of analysis and research, to own the Syrian revolution from its own people. They own it, whether we like it or not. Maybe it's, it's painful to say that, but that's exactly what happened. Who owned now the interpretation of the Syrian revolution? Yeah, we appear in the media, we said it's all about democracy, but we have to spend every time 12 hours out of the 24, just to recognize or to remind people, oh, please don't forget, in March 2011, it was a democratic one. Why? Because of the work of Al-Qaeda. Every day when you see the news, just imagine how, how percentage it's dedicated to Al-Qaeda activities. Either it's Al-Qaeda themselves or their ideology, their people. The people every day being posted, you know, and then their, their pictures, their stories were killed in the compact, in the battlefield. 99% jihadists either Al-Qaeda or groups associated to Al-Qaeda. Every single day, if you serve the internet, Twitter, the uh, 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 all sorts of, of, of media or like digital world, the cyber world, I think heavily dominated by Al-Qaeda ideology to interpret or to interpreting the Syrian revolution from their own perspective. That's why at the beginning, they started with the um, what they call Jabhat al-Nusra. They don't want to provoke people because of Al-Qaeda bad reputation in Iraq during the Zarqawi period. The killing and executing people, the sectarian fighting, uh, blowing up women, children, innocent people everywhere in Baghdad and Basra, Mosul, wherever you go. So they created Jabhat al-Nusra. It was a very soft version of Al-Qaeda. But at the end of the day, I know that sometimes people, they now talk about, no, yeah, Jabhat al-Nusra, it's, it's good. It's a, but the point is, what's your ideology? Why you disagree with Al-Qaeda or Baghdadi? Is it because of tactical reasons or you think religiously it's haram if you believe in this? That's the point. Like killing non-Muslim civilians, you think it's haram or you think, no, it's not good to do it now. So maybe you're gonna do it next year. So we need to be aware of this, but they share the same ideology, I believe, to a certain extent. If there's a difference, it's maybe 5%. But the ideology, it's exactly the same. It's about black and white, Kafir Muslim, kill them all if you don't agree with us. 
And their problem is, it's not just like the political system itself. If you see now what they're practicing in Syria, which is more worse than the political system itself, they want to control the social life itself. Lifestyle. And that's what they did in Iraq, Afghanistan, they're trying now in Libya, the same thing, Tunisia, wherever they go, they try to control the lifestyle pe of people. How you laugh, how you smile, how you dress, how you do that, how, everything. So even if there's no government, but in Yemen, they practice the same thing. When they control certain areas in the southern part of Yemen, it's always the same thing. The problem is most of them, they're not well educated. They don't have any like impressive CDs to be governance or local authority or whatever you want to call it. It's always it, jihadist, jihadist. I fought against the Soviet Union. Yeah, I was in Afghanistan that period. Yeah, I was in Algeria that, which is all of it. I think it's a dodgy experience basically, in fact, you know. It's not an impressive one. It means people sh they should be aware of this. But anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, their, their ideology, I believe, in, in wherever you go in, uh, in, um, in Syria now, you would see very strong or you would hear very strong presence of their ideology. Even people that are not Al-Qaeda members. I'll give you an example, you know. If you go to Al-Jash al-Hur, Liwa al-Tawheed, it's one of the most important, I think, unit in, in Aleppo, if it's not the, the most powerful one. Liwa al-Tawheed, it's, it's not Al-Qaeda. It's not started as a jihadist group because it's Al-Jash al-Hur, the PC army, which is the only, like, acceptable from international perspective, at least, you know, like a combat unit of the Syrian revolution. They've been forced to adopt a lot of Al-Qaeda rhetoric, the ideological one. If you see their statements, their logos, how they interpreting things, their names, their units, to match or to cope up with the what's going on, the culture there. If you want to understand what I'm trying to say, just try to analyze this. How the 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 uh, 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 struggled a lot, and they ended up part of Al Jabhah Al Islamiya. Now they emerged with Jabhah Al Islamiya, and their leader, which is Abdul Qadir Saleh, he was the most obstacle of Al Qaeda uh, existence, if I say, or presence in Iraq, mainly in, in Syria, only uh, 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 mainly in in in, in Aleppo, because he was very popular, uh, a real leader, uh, genuine Syrian fighter believes in his people, uh, never ever, I think, commit any crime. And if you're not Syrian, he was assassinated by one of Al-Qaeda leaders. Uh, but, but what I'm trying to say is, even the names, the units, the flag, the logos, it's, it needs a lot of like research to do that, to find out exactly what kind of culture influenced the other units, which is like non-Islamist or non-Jihadist units, to do this. You will see the culture of Al-Qaeda it's growing bigger, bigger everywhere. Even people, they don't believe in Al-Qaeda ideology, but they have to match what says Al-Qaeda uh, established already in, 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 in Iraq. Sorry, in, in Syria. So this is the ideology. Then the second issue, it's the organization. Most of their activities, it has to do how to organize. It's not the old style, just you create your own people, then you take a bay'ah, which is like the religious oud. No, it wasn't like that. Basically, they, they established a different networks, different units, to make sure they govern already, already liberated space, spaces. It's not just about like fighting the old style of all the jihadist groups. If you analyze in Nusra, and even now the Islamic State or other groups, for instance, they have, a, like there's, uh, there is um, a phenomenon of uh, the, call, they call it Islamic courts, Mahakam Sharia, everywhere. I think even from a religious perspective, if we send like well religious leaders from Saudi Arabia or maybe Al Azhar or Tunisia, Zaytuna, I'm sure they will order, you know, like the, the arrest of all these guys because they are not qualified to be judges. You know, especially in Islam, you know, and everywhere, in every single respective nation, to be a judge, it's the most, I think, risky business to do, to appear as a judge, okay? Now, if you go to Syria, everywhere, they, it's, it's the idea of Jabhat al-Nusra now, but everywhere, it's not like the Islamists now. You will see like Al-Mahkam al-Sharia, Al-Mahkam al the religious court, the religious court, the religious court. They said, this is the court will uh, settle all the disputes between different groups, fighting, whatever, talk about the Ghanaim, the looting after, after battlefields, even personal issues, uh, family matters as well, you know. Okay, what do you need more than this? 
when you already established like a, a legal justice system between two practices, and most of the people they're running the show, either they are your members or based on your understanding of legal justice system. I met with a lot of Ira uh, Syrian judges and uh, people that used to be uh, uh, attorneys, they, they, they said, we can do nothing. And they asked for help from everybody to be trained and to try to, you know, establish, you know, a, uh, especially in different issues, establish themselves inside Syria itself. Unfortunately, even the Western governments or the international uh, community failed to help them or to support them, despite they have specific items in international aid agendas to do this, but they failed to do that. So that's, that's the, the new model of organizations. You know, it's not just like the Amir and his shura and people fighting and shouting and screaming a lot, but no, it's not. Then you have the charities. And Nusra, until now, it's, it was and still the most, I think, organization or powerful organization distributing goods, utilities as well, electricity, fuel, everywhere. And even they managed to protect a lot of businesses in, in Alabo. I'm aware of uh, certain occasions when uh, other units, which is not Islamist, they uh, blackmailed a Christian Syrian in Alabo. He's a businessman, he used to uh, own a factory, and they, uh, you know, they forced him to pay money on a monthly basis as a tax, you know, whatever, to, to... Okay. Oh, half an hour, okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, uh, so he went to uh, an Nusra. He went to an Nusra and he asked them for protection. He said, okay, these guys, every month, they're hassling me and they forced me to pay this amount of money or they would vent my factory. I've done nothing. I'm, from the beginning, I'm with the revolution. I've never ever been part of the regime. So I'm a Syrian. This is my country. This is my land. I'm part of it. I'm not a foreigner. They protected him also. Without a single penny. They didn't take any money from him. And everybody knows, like, this guy and his factory and business, like, protected by a Nusra guns. Since then, no one even can touch him. So even they brought, if I might say, policing as well, security and policing in areas under their, their control. This is the new organization, which is a very, very powerful model of how to run and govern spaces. The third one is the daily activities, like the daily struggle. That's what you call a narrative, which is like in Arabic, maybe you call it sardiyat. If you do research, in one week only about Syria, okay? Just to follow the daily news, what's going on inside Syria itself. Okay? The narrative. I am sure you come up with one conclusion in any given week. It's like, yeah, it's a jihadi cause, it's a jihadi struggle. Like the everyday news, I'm talking about inside Syria, not outside Syria. In every single area. Even the conflict between like, ethnic group when Al-Qaeda idiots, they try to attack the Kurds up north, you know, based on ethnic groups or try to, let's say, uh, uh, kill Alawites or whatever, but it's still based on certain ideology, even the bad things. But you will keep hearing or listening or gathering information related to one particular ideology. Do some analysis about the pictures of people killed in any given week, all their pictures, and how they've been introduced, the names of the units they were under you will come up with the conclusion I mentioned. That's the everyday struggle itself and the slogans itself, you know. Now, the way how established myself, a Muslim, and I believe in Quran, alhamdulillah, yani. But the way how these guys, they use Islam and Sharia itself, it's ridiculous. It's not the Sharia we believe in, you know. It's not the Islam we think. It's just as a tools and means how to control people, how to establish their own, if I may, a very totalitarian regime. That's the way how they do it. But the problem is, everyday struggle in their favor. Because they are the people controlling lands, controlling places, they're running the fights against the regime, they control the media, they appear everywhere uh, in, in the media. Every time you'll see them in most like the ch uh, channels. When it comes to what's going on inside Syria, not outside Syria, because we know they don't believe in politics, they believe that said their guns is gonna establish their own Islamic state the way how they believe in it. And uh, I think all of them, they believe in one thing, Syria, for them, it's not the end, but it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a big organization for them because they don't believe in lands, whatever, and this is in their documents as well, as I referred to 2006. They think that's the only land 
is going to give them access to Israel to fight against Israel. So they are not in the business to establish a Syrian state, even an Islamic state in Syria. No, it's just big organization, a new vehicle, a new model of organizing to go to another battle. So there is nothing, I believe, for the Syrians themselves or the Syrian revolution with these guys. I'm so sorry for uh, my very long presentation, but I think it's, um, it's worth it. Thank you very much.